Jackie, ever since I entered this world as a baby, I realized I had a body and bodies need good health to keep me happy. And AI, the more I learn about it, the more I realize this is where it gets really personal. Yeah, forget AI cleaning up your inbox or writing your emails. This could have a massive impact. Many think AI's most important breakthroughs are still decades away. But artificial intelligence has already solved the biggest problem in biology you've probably never heard of. It's called protein folding prediction. Bear with me. Here comes the science bit. Proteins are so much more than just what constitutes our muscles. They're the building blocks of life. They begin as strings of chemical compounds, which then fold into a 3D structure. That shape determines how it's going to function. If it's going to become an antibody, an enzyme, or a messenger, for instance. That's important because a protein shape gives clues about diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's. Pinpointing a protein structure used to be a manual, painstaking process that could take months, and no computerized technique ever came close to matching human accuracy. That was until Google's AI research arm DeepMind cracked the code with a program it called AlphaFold. Trained on thousands of known proteins and their shapes, AlphaFold predicted the 3D structures of almost every known protein in the human genome, about 200 million in all. Okay, IRL, this means scientists can understand diseases better and quicker. It can also help develop new medicines. Make no mistake, it's a major achievement but it essentially did something humans can already do. It just did it infinitely faster. Whether you know it or not, artificial intelligence is already being used in practice, from skin cancer screenings, medication recommendations, to therapy chatbots. But not everyone is convinced. Six in 10 US adults say they would feel uncomfortable if their own healthcare provider relied on AI to do things like diagnose disease and recommend treatments. Perhaps that will change when we see real life results. The question will be, if the AI doctor could see you now, <laughs> would you want it to? Eric Corbett, great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so you are Chief Scientific Officer at Microsoft, an AI researcher for decades, and you're also a doctor. Yes, I, I basically came to medical school pursuing an MD, PhD in neurobiology, but I got very interested in minds and computation and the computational basis of thinking, and I moved into MD and AI research. Okay, 1985, set the scene for us. What was the field of AI like back then, and did you ever expect it to get to this point? Well, in 1985, people were, researchers were grappling with the idea of applying what are called theorem-proving methods, logical reasoning, uh, if A and B, then C, to medicine, and it was so hard to, capture all the nuances and the uncertainties, the way a doctor thinks about problems, bringing in lots of information, having a hunch, um, pursuing evidence the way a Sherlock Holmes might pursue evidence. The systems didn't have that capability. Um, my generation of researchers really dove into the uncertainty aspects, probabilities, reasoning methods. A lot of the work was handcrafted. Since then, we've gone into a world where we have systems today that um, we've taught how to train themselves on massive corpora. Now, back in 1985, we didn't even have the web. There was very little content that was even digitized. Now our systems have access to huge amounts of information and data in digital form that they couldn't even get their eyes on in 1985. We were talking about how you store this type of data just before this on huge disks. Laser disks. Laser disks. <laughs> well, I was talking specifically about the Doomsday Project and the BBC did in like the 1980s. It was amazing. I grew up with the floppy disk, putting it into the school computer, taking it home. Um, but there was also, we were touching on Clippy. Were you part of that? Yes, I led the research team uh, that uh, created what became known as Clippy. And behind the scenes, there was quite sophisticated reasoning back then. Uh, I've seen calls on Twitter these days for, you know, bring back a smart, a really smart version of Clippy. Uh, I but miss, in the context of health, we have come a long way from Clippy. We've also had huge breakthroughs like protein folding prediction. What's the next big breakthrough in AI in health? What are you seeing now that you're excited about? 
we started playing with some of the, the, the latest, what are called models uh, uh, in AI about six months ago. And uh, some of that work included explorations in education, uh, in healthcare, in, in, in the core sciences. Um, and I have to say that in, in my you know, 30 to 40 years of AI research, I have never seen uh, and been astounded by such brilliance coming out of these systems. Uh, the, the sheer depth, uh, the ability to integrate information, uh, really surprising and exciting to me in terms of the possibilities for harnessing these systems uh, to help in various aspects of healthcare, including medical, the workflows that doctors deal with daily, communication with patients, uh, even doing new science to, to identify new medications, for example. Um, I had an email from a friend of yours. Um, uh, more specifically, he didn't email it to me. He posted it on his blog. Uh, his name is Bill Gates. Uh -huh. He's, he said in, in this blog, and this is earlier this year, um, other AI-driven improvements will be especially important for poor countries where the vast majority of under five deaths happen. The AI models used in poor countries will need to be trained on different diseases um, than in rich countries. There is almost literally a whole other world out there that is it's going to require completely different training, completely different models, completely different applications. How do you see the challenge there, and um, how often do you talk to to Mr. Gates about this? Well, it was, I, good to hear that. Uh, so I've been working very closely with Bill and with uh, his colleagues. In fact, we've had some great collaborations with people who lead up the global health work at at the, at the Gates Foundation exploring how these models could actually level the playing field, could, could bridge the tech divide between North and South, between uh, the folks that are very savvy and people that haven't really played with AI in the past. Some of the models we've looked at uh, help show how well things can go when it comes to um, upskilling uh, folks who don't have formal medical degrees in places where resources are scarce. Uh, certain cities in Africa, for example. We've looked at problems where how well would these systems work with informing a, a, a healthcare worker to talk with experts after seeing a patient and in multiple languages. The beauty, for example, of not just the expertise in healthcare, but to translate languages very quickly across many languages that might be shared among not shared among different tribes, for example, is really impressive. There's also the question of bias in AI models and what that looks like in a healthcare context. Uh, experts have raised questions about the accuracy of some AI-based skin cancer systems, for example, that aren't as accurate for darker skin tones or don't recognize them um, appropriately. So this is a real concern. Um, the question that comes up is, and we've seen these examples, does the data that our systems are using to learn from that we train the systems on come from a society that's so filled with bias that the data itself is biased and therefore the systems may and can reflect the biases that we want we don't really think are appropriate to have um, that we've, we've lived with in, for, for decades in our society can we basically go beyond that and so uh, work at Microsoft and other places has looked at taking models and really probing them for biases and fairness with different definitions of fairness uh, understanding how well they perform for different demographics, and then uh, coming up with, with effective guardrails that l sort of level them out, uh, given a definition of fairness, so they do perform well. It all comes down to being very aware uh, of the challenges. Where does the liability come in with AI being applied in health, do you think? Well, we have to be very careful with how AI is actually uh, applied. Um, it's rare you hear someone say that AI should be a direct drive to action or decision making. We talk a lot about the the expert healthcare professional is the ultimate decision maker and want to do our best to support the thinking and reasoning of the the experts. Uh, so the the liability is not with the systems. Uh, we like to say it's the we want to depend and and on the responsible decision maker, the human decision maker. That said, AI researchers and AI and medicine researchers are responsible for making sure that these systems team beautifully with uh, healthcare professionals. So we don't have to be worried that a curbside doctor robot is going to be replacing medical providers anytime soon. 
I don't think so. And, and even beyond the, the reasoning and the, th and the thinking and, and you might say the, 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 um, the clinical judgment aspect of healthcare, there's the human touch and there's the human in intuition and insight and the ability of people to really think way out of the box in ways that our AI systems don't work just yet. So I view them as complementary uh, and um, as valuable. So in one sentence, and this is a big ask, what do you think is one aspect of AI as it relates to healthcare that not enough people are talking about? I think people aren't realizing yet that it's not just about um, helping physicians do better, which would be fabulous, uh, or reducing the drudgery of the daily workflow that physicians grapple with. It's about core bioscience. You mentioned protein folding, and we thought about protein folding before. Um, to understand the foundations of, of biology, to identify new medications, or even old medications that could be repurposed for new diseases. Uh, we've had prototypes, and we're working on research now to show how these systems can help at the foundations of healthcare, to make healthcare a whole, to change the game uh, in ways to introduce new efficiencies and, uh, and, and new techniques. So I'm most excited about new discovery at the foundational level of science uh, that will change the way we do, we practice medicine. Dr. Marzia Gassemi, thanks so much for joining us. So you're an assistant professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science, and you also lead the Healthy Machine Learning Group. Could you tell us a little bit about what that group does? Sure. Uh, our lab focuses on three main things. So number one, we're trying to design machine learning models that work better on healthcare data. Uh, number two, we're trying to use state-of-the-art machine learning methods to audit current healthcare systems and processes. And number three, we're trying to understand how humans can best use these machine learning systems that we've trained, because the best model and the best human don't always equal the best practice. So a lot of the AI models right now in medicine are using data that's coming from sick people versus healthy people. Could you talk to us a little bit about the implications of that? I, I think the thing to remember is when we often are thinking about other tasks, so in vision, we see lots of normal examples of an image. So we see lots of normal examples of a dog playing, happy, different environments, different settings. And then we know what dogs look like in general. And so now that we have an idea of what a normal dog looks like, we could easily figure out that this dog is sick because it doesn't look like this huge number of examples of a normal dog. And that's not what we're doing in health. In health, we don't have lots and lots of examples of healthy people. We have some examples of people when they're sick, and we have lots and lots of examples of people when they're at their very sickest. And that really limits the scope of what we're able to look at in terms of prediction tasks or forecasting for human health. At the top of the episode, we discussed why protein folding prediction was such a major breakthrough in AI and medicine. What's the next big breakthrough that you're most excited about? I think if AI could actually give people some sense of what sort of diagnostics and prognostics they could expect uh, with, with meaningful suggestions, that would be amazing. In most of the treatments that we have today, doctors have to use a small handful of treatments and they essentially try them sequentially, right? Especially if we look at chronic health conditions uh, with limited treatment options or mental health conditions, they essentially are trying the first option that everybody tries and then the next one if that fails and then the next one if that fails. And this kind of guessing can prolong your response time by months or years. And so being able to understand what treatments will work well for specific patients that are on a particular pathway, I think would be extremely powerful and more efficient. If there's one thing that we've learned during the making of this series is that there's no clear rule in our company for whether we can expense trips to cat cafes uh, where we've worked on our scripts. But if there's a second thing, it's that there's a big difference between the kind of approach that you would expect or want with AI and a doctor in, say, your family clinic and in an emergency setting, you know, where there's a crisis. And I know this is something that you've, you've written a lot about and, and done a study about, and I wondered if you could talk us through what you learned from that study. So we did an experiment uh, where we took a bunch of doctors and non-doctors, and we gave them hypothetical crisis line calls that were transcribed. And then we changed whether we said the person was black or non-black, Muslim or non-Muslim. And then 
ask them uh, whether they should uh, have the police called or whether medical help should come in. And uh, great news, everyone, uh, doctors and non-doctors, when you don't give them advice, are not biased. And so they uh, did not disproportionately call for police on Black and Muslim people. Then we took a GPT model and we intentionally biased it uh, by feeding it examples of sentences that say that Black people go to jail or Muslim people are violent. And then we let that biased model give advice to people who are making this decision, doctors and non-doctors, same decision. Should we call for police help or medical help? Um, and if there's a risk of violence, you should call the police. So, you know, they're completely equivalent predictions. But we've found that when the biased model gave the descriptive advice, there's a risk of a violence, everybody ignored it. So you did not disproportionately call the police, right? You retained original fair decision making for doctors and non-doctors. Um, but when you gave the biased advice in a prescriptive way, the AI model thinks you should call the police. It's the same recommendation, but people followed it. And I think that's really scary because this is an understudied field. If we are sometimes wrong, as all models will be, and we're maybe wrong a little bit more on minoritized populations, as much research has shown, then I am concerned that if we present it in these tiny different ways that don't account for human behavior and biases, such as automation bias, we might just extend and exacerbate biases that already exist in society. And in one sentence, maybe, do you have one big prediction for the next advancement um, that, that you're seeing in your field? I think we're going to start to use AI as a cracked mirror. I think we're going to start to look at these weird, bad, strange things that AI does, wonder why it's doing that, and realize it's doing that because we did it. It's doing that because human data generated that pattern, and now it's just copying that pattern. And so I think we're going to start to use AI as a way of auditing and improving the processes that it's being applied to. Peter Kachkamiti, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so you're CEO and co-founder of Chiron Medical. It's a cancer diagnostics company. Correct. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how AI has made cancer diagnostics better over the last few years? Um, I would say it hasn't made it better yet, but it's on the way. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we have been able to do at Chiron is uh, bring a piece of AI software called Mia, uh, we call it next generation AI, and deliver it into live practice to support doctors. Um, and with, this, with the help of doctors and AI working together, we were able to significantly increase the cancer detection rate in breast cancer screening. This is a very recent development, but the importance of this is um, it's about a 13% increase uh, in cancer detection, and that has actually the, a good shot of uh, halving the number of missed cancers that we generally expect in breast cancer screening. That's pretty big, it's, so it's, 50%. It's huge. And uh, I mean, just before we started taping, you know, you said something pretty profound, which is AI is probably our best, if not only, shot in solving cancer. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to know that cancer is a very unique disease. It's quite different from everything else in how it needs to be treated. Uh, it does two very particular things that you don't get with other diseases. One is uh, in the early stages when we really want to detect it, uh, it tricks the body uh, really behaving as if it was normal tissue. And the second problem is very similarly also an information problem. It takes a lot of information uh, uh, gathered and, and put together, and that is just not really feasible on a large scale. And frankly, a lot of the information that is generated about the patients is actually not used to make the right decisions for the patients. And this is where AI can help. AI can go through the volume of the information, it can aggregate, and this is the absolute only way I believe that we can ever tackle cancer. This is a very personal topic for me because I lost my dad to cancer when I was a child, almost 30 years ago to the day, in fact. And it, I'd, be, I'd love to hear from your perspective and your experience, like how that process in terms of detection and treatment like has evolved over a 30 year period. And it's a huge ask, <laughs> um, but, but how, do you, how have you seen that changed and where do you see it going next? Are we at an inflection point? you know, perhaps? 
I think we are at a diagnostic inflection point that is actually, um, I think is the key unlock to have an overall inflection point. Uh, if, we, if we look at it, there has been new treatments coming out that on their own in a very targeted way have been very, very helpful and for a certain a set of patients but not overall. If you look at the overall cancer death rates, the um, even uh, adjusted for age and, and all sorts of things, even then the death rates are rising. And uh, that, that's a problem. So diagnostic is the key. Humans on their own in the current healthcare systems cannot really tackle it. The only way to do it is if we bring in AI to do the really big brute, brute force calculator that actually unlocks the wealth of data that we have about patients and actually allows us to make the right decisions. Is, this, is there a comparison here to how uh, cancer diagnostics is, is developing in that machines can see this stuff that we physically just cannot see and track? I think there, there are a couple of elements here. Uh, first of all, different levels of grayscale, different colors, different signals uh, the AI can interpret, also different motifs that our brain doesn't really process. The human brain is very specifically evolved with the eyes and the visual cortex, et cetera, to, to be good at hunting and gathering, et cetera. Uh, looking into the human body and getting all the information is not something we are naturally uh, good at. One part of this is helping get the maximum information out of images. It can be pathology, it can be radiology, and also combine that information and also look into genetic information and combine even that as well. Uh, that is not, any, not, not something any human can ever do. So this is one element, the aggregation going beyond uh, using the information that is available about a patient and really getting the maximum for the benefit of the patient is really important. I'm not to not to offend anyone in astrology, but if you miss a star or something, that's that might be okay. But if you miss a cancer for a patient, that might be a life. Uh, mm -hmm. So you really need to be very rigorous there. In a study by Pew Research, it found that six in ten Americans wouldn't feel comfortable if their healthcare provider used AI in medication recommendations or other forms of treatment. So how do you build trust? Yeah. So the first thing is. What AI has to do is improve the standard of care of where we are. As long as we're improving the standard of care, AI is helping, and that's where we need to start. Wherever doctors are involved, they also make mistakes, and that's important to keep in mind. Uh, again, we want to reduce those mistakes. The AI will make mistakes. The human will make mistakes. They will do different mistakes because they use different information. When you put the two together the right way, that's when we can get the absolute maximum for a patient, and that's what it is, uh, uh, it is all about. What's your one big prediction for AI and healthcare, over and above the many fantastic ones you've already presented to us today, um, that you're most excited about, over, let's say, in the next 10 years? So I think AI is going to be accepted as a tool, an extremely powerful tool that makes our lives easier, makes us think better, and not just do manual jobs, and uh, it has a shot of uh, fixing cancer care. <laughs> There's no question that AI has done some remarkable things in medicine and can do even greater things over the next few years. And if there's another thing that I've taken away from this is that we're gonna need care. And sometimes we just need a hand to hold, don't we?